When people want to learn anything, it could be a software development concept or data science concept, anything. Do you have tips on how they can most effectively do that? If you look at like the highest performing individuals, like maybe Steph Curry or presidents, they all have coaches, right? They all have someone who can help them. Invariably, what I found in consulting arrangements or even uh, you know in work, someone will say, why is that? Well, why did you get that number, right? And so, if you are not working with raw data, making those explanations, tracing your code is kind of hard. Matt, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you on air. Where in the world are you calling in from? Thanks, John. I'm in Utah. I'm in, uh, I guess, snowy Utah right now. And mm. uh, happy, happy to be on. Thanks for having me. Utah famous for its alpine skiing this time of year. Is that something you engage in or do you take advantage of the great outdoors you have around you out there? It is. Yeah. Um, I live about 45 minutes away from, I think six ski resorts. So, um, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. I, I can't complain other than this year, the snow has not been great. So I'm going to cross my fingers that it snows a little bit more. It's, uh, you know, there just hasn't been enough snow. Yeah. That's annoying. Yeah, January has been like the third lowest uh, producing snow month for, for January's in record. So Damn, yeah. We're, well, we're recording early February, so hopefully uh, by the time this episode airs in March, you've been dumped on heavily and you get some nice powder days out there. Yeah. Um, so we've known each other kind of indirectly for a while. So we both teach in the O'Reilly platform and we both teach data science courses in the platform. Um, we both follow each other on LinkedIn and Twitter, and we engage in each other's content uh, on social media. And Noah Gift, who was in episode number 467, he also, he kind of introduced us. He didn't formally introduce us, but he there was this group of collaborators or potential collaborators where he said, you know, you guys might like to talk to each other. But we never had, we'd never had a phone call. We never met in person. So we're, we're meeting on air and it's really exciting because your expertise is something that I'm super keen to dig into. I'm sure our audience is as well. Um, you've written seven best-selling books. So you've written The Illustrated Guide to Learning Python 3, Intermediate Python, Learning the Pandas Library, Effective PyCharm, The Machine Learning Pocket Reference, and The Pandas Cookbook, which is now in its second edition. So that's six. Number seven just came out in November and it's called Effective Pandas. So we're going to dig into that in this episode. And if, if you were watching the YouTube version, you might want to check it out if you're just listening because Matt just <laughs> picked up all of those seven books in a row as I was going through them and showed them uh, to the screen. So you've written a ton of content. Congrats on that. And um, I should be asking you questions later in the episode about just how you kind of you set out to to do these to to do these books. But one question for you first is: uh, some of your books are self-published, whereas others are with the most well-known publishers in technology, like O'Reilly. So, what are the pros and cons of self-publishing versus working with a big publisher? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Um, so, people write books for different reasons. And, uh, you, you know, some people, I've heard them say that they literally just want to have a book that has an animal on the cover, right? And if they get that, <laughs> then like, that's the, the badge that they want, um, right. which is great. And, and some people have different reasons for publishing, right? They want to, uh, maybe they just want their content to be open and, and then they're going to sort of self-publish it. Other people kind of do some cross of that where they have open content, but then it eventually gets published. So I, I would say one of the nice things about working with a publisher is that you've got someone maybe dangling a carrot in front of you or like slapping you with a stick and making <laughs> you make progress. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people like, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. And they might say they want to write a book, but when you get into it, it, it you know, writing a book is a lot of hard work. It's a lot of getting up early or staying up late and just putting in the work. It's sort of like, I guess, training for a marathon. A lot of people are like, I want to do a marathon. 
Well, are you out training for it? Are you out running almost every day? If you're not, it's going to be painful to do, do a, a book. And so mm-hmm. you do get a lot of support from uh, your publisher, especially on the editing. Another nice thing about a, a, a publisher is generally they make you make a proposal at the start right. where you put in some thought about the path that you want to take someone down. And with self-publishing, it's sort of anything goes. It's easy to self-publish these days. Anyone can do it. Um, but I, I, I still think if you're doing that way, you should do a do it very structured, right? You, you would want to think about the path that you're taking someone along. You would want to work with people who can do editing. Um, you would probably want to also think about what your distribution mechanisms are as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, you know, what, what is sort of the big pro and the con? Um, for, I, I would say for, for a lot of people, it does come down to money and I'm not really going to get into specifics here, but generally when you are working with a publisher, you're getting like 15%, 10 to 15% royalty. Um, if you are, if you self publish and you just put something on Amazon and if it's priced in certain price points, you get between 30 and 70% royalty. So that in and of itself might be sufficient just because Amazon Amazon is sort of the big elephant. They've got large distribution. Um, and, and so that's uh, something to consider. Uh, also, you might want to consider your platform. It, a lot of people, the publisher, you know, can do some marketing blasts and whatnot. But at the end of the day, they've got multiple books they need to push. And, you know, after a few months, your book is not really on the top of their mind. They've got other books that they're working on. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the marketing comes down to you and what your platform is. So right. th- those are some of the pros and cons. I actually have a course on this. Uh, we can link to it in the oh, show notes. For sure. That, um, I've, I've interviewed over 12 uh, tech authors who have written books in the tech space. And mm-hmm. I've gone through and, a- and interviewed them and asked them, you know, what their process was. Some of these are published authors. Some of them are self-published. Some of them have done both. So uh, if you are considering writing a book, that might be something that you might want to check out. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say they want to write a book, but they they don't really want to write a book. They just, they just think they do. Yeah, it is a really arduous process and certainly one of the most stressful of my life. But also then when it's done, it's one of the most rewarding things in life. So I guess that's how you end up doing it seven times. Yeah, (laughs) I I guess for me, it's an itch that I wanted to scratch. Um, I guess in, in, in programming terms, there's this thing called bike shedding where people like to have their bike shed painted a certain color or whatnot. And, and it's infamous for like people rewriting the code and saying, I, I really wanted me to write the code basically. And I, I guess I, I can say that I sort of bike shed books. This is the book that I wanted, right? It's, it's the pink book instead of the green book. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so how do you choose what book you're going to write next? Why did you write Effective Pandas? Why was that the shed that needed that color at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I like that question. Um, the, so well, maybe I can give a little bit of history about um, my pandas books. My original pandas book, uh, Learning the Pandas Library, came out in 2015 or 16. And um, one of the uh, most, the earliest pandas books out there, and I had been using pandas almost since it was released publicly. Uh, prior to Pandas, I had been working as, uh, well, I started a company that was doing business intelligence reporting. And so we were doing basically retail sales reports um, for a large chain of companies. And I had basically written something very similar to Pandas in Python for generating these reports. And every... You know, there was a server that was running, they could query the server, and then there was batch processes that were running that would generate these reports that eventually got spit out as like huge 
spreadsheets with, you know, thousands of rows and often hundreds of columns that people wanted these sales reports. And when Pandas came out, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. It, it does a lot of what I'm doing, um, has some overlapping features, some different features that are, are different. But but the key part of Pandas was that it was um, leveraging NumPy and, and mine was just pure Python. And so mm. uh, by le leveraging NumPy, uh, you get a pretty big, huge uh, performance increase. Uh, so for those who are listening who aren't uh, aware, Pandas is a library for manipulating structured or tabular data. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I started using Pandas and eventually I, I'm, I, I also, I paid for my education uh, tutoring. And, and so I, I, my background is software engineering, but I, I consider myself an educator. I have a, a, every time I like learn something, I'm like, how would I want to learn this? And so that, that's sort of, I guess the impetus for me for writing books is like, what gaps are there? What what holes need to be filled? Uh, what what are like some hints or best practices that that I would want to learn if I was learning this? So that that was basically the impetus for my first pandas book. Um, later on, uh, after that, I, I started MetaSnake and started doing a bunch of consulting and training in Python and pandas, and I was approached to do the second edition of the pandas cookbook. So I, I'm not the original author of that, but oh. I did read that because as someone who's interested in pandas and as an educator, I tend to like try and consume a lot of content around that. And um, I, I like the book. Um, however, it's I, I don't feel like it's my book, right? Um, as I did the second edition, I added a few chapters. I, I rewrote or tweaked a lot of the code. Um, but I, I, I still, it didn't feel like my book. And I was at that point, I, my opinions around pandas had become, I guess, a little bit more opinionated and stronger mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. proper ways of using it. And so I was like, okay, I need to revisit my original book and, and redo that. And so that, that's what effective pandas was supposed to be. It was supposed to be like second edition of, of learning the pandas library. But as I started doing that, and, and this again goes back to like the writing book. Like you think, you think like planning out how long software takes to write is hard. You should plan out how long writing a book takes. Um, so, so I, I'm like, Oh, this is going to take like a couple of weeks. I'll just tweak a few things here and there and, and then I'll be done. And I started looking at it. I'm like, I'm basically going to throw out everything and, and start over. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that, uh, that, that was sort of the birthplace of, of effective pandas was, after many years of uh, teaching and consulting and seeing a lot of people's pandas code, seeing how people are using it, um, what is the book that I would want that I could point them to that would uh, help them write better pandas code? Perfect. Struggling with broken pipelines, stale dashboards, missing data? You're not alone. Look no further than Monte Carlo, the leading end-to-end -end data observability platform. In the same way that New Relic and Datadog ensure reliable software and keep application downtime at bay, Monte Carlo solves the costly problem of data downtime. As detailed in episode number 499 with the firm's brilliant CEO, Bar Moses, Monte Carlo monitors and alerts for data issues across your data warehouses, lakes, ETL, and business intelligence, reducing data incidents by 90% or more. Start trusting your data with Monte Carlo today. Visit www.montecarlodata.com to learn more. So yeah, so um, Pandas, as you mentioned, uh, is for working with tabular data. Not only that, it's the most popular software package for working with tabular data today and doing it in Python, which is the most popular programming language period, but also the most popular programming language for data science in particular. So it makes sense to be focusing on pandas in general, and then super cool to hear how you've made this journey uh, towards this most recent book, Effective Pandas. And yes, it is thoroughly comprehensive. So you cover how to get started with Python and pandas and just how to get it on your computer and work with it. 
it, you talk about data structures. So there are series for working with one dimensional uh, data in pandas, data frames for working with two dimensional data, um, how to effectively apply operations, how to plot memory usage considerations, how to export data, how to debug. It covers everything from end to end. And that sounds like the kind of thing you would be able to write if you had created a consulting company. And we're teaching people all the time on how to be using pandas and Python as effectively as possible. So super cool that that reference exists now. And yeah, definitely encourage folks to check it out. So something that we can probably do on AirMat is then dig in to your top pandas tips. So we actually had the creator of pandas, Wes McKinney, on a recent Super Data Science episode on number 523. And we talked about the genesis of pandas. And then we talked a lot about libraries that he's been working on since and companies that he's built. We didn't actually talk about pandas and how to use it and what his top tips might be. I'd love to hear yours. And I think you have some great ones for us. Sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll start off with what might be the most controversial tip that I see. So so as I said, I think my my thoughts around pandas and, and the proper care and feeding of pandas have, have, have grown stronger as as I've used it and, and seen it. But my first one and it is to leverage what is called chaining. Now, mm -hmm. um, if, if you go to like my Twitter, I don't generally post a lot of cat photos, but or if you go to LinkedIn, <laughs> I, I, I often will post code as images and you will see a lot of my pandas code. And this tends to elicit a strong response, either positively or negatively, the code <laughs> that I post. Uh, I've had people say, this is the worst code that I've ever seen. I've had people say that I would never work with you. And then I get also on the flip side, I get people like, this is awesome. This changed how I write code. Um, my life is much better after doing that. So let me maybe just explain basically chaining and how I see that. Uh, at, we ha in Pandas, we have basically two data structures. We have a series, which you can think of if you're thinking in the database, that's like a column from a database. And uh, then we have the, the data frame, which if you're thinking of databases, it's like a table. So those are the two main uh, structures that we have. And most operations on either a data frame or a series, and there's about 400 different methods, if you look at those on both of them, most of those will return back one of those objects, a series or a data frame, or sometimes if they're reducing, they might return a scalar object back. So if, if you think about like a, from a data science perspective, especially like data janitor work, cleaning up your data, prepping it for machine learning or whatnot, most of the data in the wild is not great as is. It needs a lot of sort of nudging, cleaning up, maybe uh, reformatting it or restructuring it how it is. And um, I like to write those uh, restructuring uh, instructions as a series of basically uh, steps, step by step. And, and a lot of, so what I'll do is I'll actually put a parenthesis at the top of my code and I'll put a parenthesis at the end. And, and parentheses mean a couple things in Python, but in this case, uh, this is a parenthesis for basically a parenthetical. Like if you're doing a math operation, you would add two numbers before multiplying them. And, and what it allows you to do in Python is it allows you to basically escape white space rules. So I can say, I'm gonna start off with my raw data and then I'm gonna to go to the next line and then I'm gonna just put the single operation that I'm gonna do on the next line. I actually have on, on, on my screen here, I've got uh, some pandas code that I've written uh, for a sales report uh, that I generated. And so maybe I can just describe a, it for- A sales report of your own yeah. uh, sales? Yeah, of, of my own sales from, from uh, the Metasnake website. Um, and, and so uh, I guess I can put that on the screen here for YouTubers, but um, amazing. Um, you can see that at the top there, I've got cells, right? So I'm just gonna take my sales data frame. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna query it. So I've got a single call to the query method and I'm just filtering uh, cells that were actually paid and I'm filtering the bundle. And so that is going to return a data frame. So I'm gonna just keep operating on that. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a group by. This is one of those super powerful features of pandas 
lets you basically pivot the data. And I'm going to group mm -hmm. this by the date at a month uh, frequency. And I'm also going to pivot it by a category. So this is going to give me what's called a hierarchical uh, index or multi-index when I return this. Um, and then on that grouping, I want to apply these two aggregations. So that's the next line is the aggregations. I'm going to uh, total the sales, and then I'm going to uh, count the number of items in there. That's going to return me another data frame. Now this is going to, because of how I grouped it, I grouped it with date and category. It's going to have a hierarchical uh, index. And so I, I want to do the next line here is I'm going to unstack that, which is going to rotate uh, one of the indexes into a column. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off one of those columns uh, because this is now hierarchical columns. I'm going to pull off on the columns, which is total sales. And then I'm going to pull off the course column from that. And this should give me basically the sum of all the course sales and the count of all the course sales. And then I'm going to add uh, some exponentially weighted uh, moving averages to uh, sort of do a, a very simple prediction on that, which is uh, the next line after that. So this is all written. Uh, there's about eight steps in this, which is basically I want to do a simple prediction on what my core sales will be like, but, but I've written it in this chain. And generally when I'm writing this, I can sort of step through it one line at a time. I'm, I'm starting at the raw data and then I'm just building this chain, which if you, if, if you get used to this, starts looking like a recipe and then uh, your code uh, is very easy to come back to. What I find generally is that 90 plus percent of people when they're writing pandas, they'll write each of these steps, each of these eight steps is like either an individual line and store the intermediate data frame mm -hmm. or they'll put mm -hmm. them in different cells and they might even not mm -hmm. put the cells in the right order. Mm -hmm. And so what I find is that that makes it really hard to understand, yeah. and it also makes it really hard to come back to. Hard to understand because our brains have limited capacity. If you look at the working mm -hmm. memory, right, what you can store in your brain, mm -hmm. you know, commonly people say seven plus or minus two. And if I've got all these intermediate variables that I'm just keeping around, that's to me, that's just digital noise. It's getting in the way. I don't really care about those. I care about the end result. So I'm just mm -hmm. sort of, it, it's like saying, I'm going to put some restrictions on how you code. And it might feel like those restrictions are harder, but after you sort of embrace the restrictions, it's going to force you to write better code. What I can do after I've written this chain is I can then take that whole chain, and oftentimes I'll, I'll make a chain to like clean up, just do janitorial work, and I'll take that chain, put it into a function, and put it at the very top of my, my a notebook. And then when I come back to my notebook, all I have to do is load my raw data and then run this function that cleans it up and I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about running these cells in arbitrary order or keeping track of these intermediate things. So that, that's probably a, a practice. And I find it similar to, to like, I also teach on Python. And when I teach people about Python, one of the things that's weird in Python is white space. It's, it's kind of novel for the language. And a lot of people, especially those who have years of like, see your job experience come to python and, and maybe their 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 company saying you know what we're using python because like you said it's the most popular language for certain uh applications so we're gonna we're gonna learn python even though you're a job or CEO expert and a lot of these people are like oh it's got white space and 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 that white space really bothers me that you have to indent even though these people indent their code normally but they're like mm -hmm. that bothers me and and what i find is most of the people after a day of like just learning the rules are like, this doesn't even matter. It's not even a big deal. And so similar thing here with the chaining. Um, it is different because most people aren't doing it and most people don't see it. But if you adopt this, um, my take is that it's generally going to make it so you are focused on making a recipe of code, of steps that you're going to do. And it's going to force you to uh, uh, be more clear and uh, you're going to be able to read your code and come back to it. But also, if you start sharing it or collaborating with others, it's really easy to do that. And if you if you write it in a single chain, you can start testing it as well. You put it into a function, and now you can test it. You really don't care about the intermediate state. You you only care about the end result of that. So you th this basically wraps up the recipe from raw data to end result. Well, so that, that's uh, my first uh, tip. Uh, yeah, and. So I have good news for you, Matt, which is that I am firmly in the chaining camp. 
Uh, so I absolutely love chaining for, there's no point in me repeating <laughs> everything that you just said, you articulately made the case for chaining and then even summarized it. So I'm not going to bore the audience by just repeating it again, but I am a big chainer. I love not having intermediate variables. They just, as you say, they're just clutter. They make it harder to understand my own code, to understand other people's code. I love chaining and I've been into the idea ever since the dplyr library in R. So I was big into R before I got into Python and the dplyr library allowed the same thing. And the, my first experiences with that with piping uh, in R was like, this is incredible. My code is so much cleaner and easier to understand. You just have this process, just this pipe of processing. You showed us the example in code, actually in your screen share there. And yeah, you can have any, you, you're just your data just flow through this pipeline and you can see exactly what that pipeline is from start to finish. It's so neat and clean. Um, and yeah, so I do the same with my pandas code as well. Awesome. Thank you for that first. Tip. You're, you're in the 1% club. <laughs> well, we are a, I think a very elite 1%. Uh, yeah. I, I'm trying to make that not 1%, but th this is something that I see that a lot of, a lot of like blog posts or people like, how to use pandas they, they just don't even talk about this so I, I feel like this is for some reason a lot of people from r you know they're used to the pipe and, and people from python world that it's just not, novel to which them. is interesting because even in in unix at the command line yeah piping is super common yeah um Anyway, well, yeah, so that was your first tip. That's my and first tip. What's yeah, up my, next? My next one would probably be working with raw data. And, and this isn't necessarily Panda specific, but it, maybe you can combine it with, you know, if, if you are making this chain and you do what I said, you, you load your data and then you have this chain. I like to take that and, and put it into a function. And then I put the, the cell that loads my data at the very top and the next one that just cleans it uh, below that as a function. Invariably, what I found in consulting arrangements or even, uh, you know, in work or, or um, teaching, someone will say, why is that? Why did you get that number, right? And so if you are not working with raw data, it, making those explanations, tracing your code is kind of hard. But if you're using chaining and you work with the raw data, you can actually trace the code and you can trace the data through every step of that. And you can say, oh, this is why the average is this. Or, and, and it makes um, basically explaining to the higher ups very easy if you work with the raw data. So that would be probably my second tip. Nice. That one was quite concise <laughs> after chaining was so in depth. But yeah, working with raw data, it's almost self explanatory. If you don't work with the raw data, how are you going to be able to explain in any detail? Uh, if there's any further probing on on some summary stats that you have. So I love that. You can also, uh, working with raw data, you can also identify issues. You know, there's, there could be issues with the incoming data pipelines that in summary stats, those are uh, obscured and uh, yeah, and, and misleading. All right, nice. So that's chaining that we've already got. We've got working with raw data. What's your third tip for us, Matt? Yeah, my next one is related to both of those, but I'm going to mention it separately. And that would be, organizing your Jupyter code, which again, might not be Panda specific, but if, if you follow that chain and then you uh, put your code in a way where you can execute your cells one by one, what that does is it starts to enable collaboration and enable you to work with your code easily. One, one of the common complaints that you hear in the Python realm is that Jupyter, although it's nice because you can execute things out of order or whatnot, it makes things hard and yeah, I get that. I mean, sometimes when I'm doing loose goose exploratory data analysis, I might just make random cells all over the place. But if I were to run that from start to end, it wouldn't work. Um, mm -hmm. So leveraging sort of the, the best practice of chaining. And then, you know, I like to tell my students, anytime you're going to start to collaborate with someone, you do want to make sure that you can take your notebook and run it from the start to the end without issues. There's nothing 100%. more frustrating than coming to a notebook that if you look at like in notebooks, actually there's numbers on the side that tell you the order in which uh, cells mm -hmm. were executed. And you go yeah. through these and it's like higher numbers can, come before lower numbers, yeah, indicating that yeah, the cell yeah, above yeah. was run after the cells below it. No matter what tools and programming languages you use, I believe that every data scientist should be able to use the Unix command line. 
In episode 531, I spoke with Jeroen Janssens, CEO at Data Science Workshops and author of the book, Data Science at the Command Line. Well, I just learned that Jeroen has a new cohort-based course called Embrace the Command Line. You can apply now for the first cohort, which is 50% off and starts March 20th. You'll learn together with other data scientists and during live sessions with Jeroen himself. For details and upcoming cohorts, visit datascienceatthecommandline.com. That's datascienceatthecommandline.com. Yeah, you should be able to clear all outputs and restart the notebook and just run all cells and all the numbers should be in order. You should not have any errors thrown. Exactly. It's, it's maddening if you get a notebook sent to you that only works if you execute the cells out of order. Yeah. So, so again, that's probably one of those things where you just have to put some constraints on and make sure that uh, you're doing things in inside a certain framework and that will help you. Uh, next one would probably be an, another one that you see a, a lot of people throwing around advice on the internet, which is they say there's this apply method, which if, if you think about it, is it, sort of like pipe, but it, um, it, it has a drawback. So for those who aren't aware, uh, again, we, we have series and we have a data frame and a, a series basically is a vector of data and how pandas works is basically leveraging NumPy and what NumPy gives us is it instead of having a, a series of individual Python objects like Python integers or Python floats, it's going to give us a buffer of, of uh, data in memory and uh, we don't have the overhead of Python uh, for a series. And so if you want to add something to a series, you can say like plus two, and it will leverage modern computer architecture, SIMD instructions, and um, uh, basically say, here's the buffer, add two to that, it will give you a new buffer versus uh, using apply, what apply will say, pull out each individual number, convert it to a Python object, then run uh, some code on it. So people, you'll, you'll hear this thrown around, oh, you can use apply and you just write Python code and it works. It does work. However, you, at this point, you're going down what I say is the slow path because you're taking mm -hmm. something that's very optimized and you're pulling it back into Python, which is a slow language. Mm -hmm. So if you can avoid apply, generally your code will run faster. Now, there are cases uh, where I think apply is okay. So maybe I'll just put a caveat on that. If you're doing numeric operations and you're using apply to me, that's a code smell, a hint that you probably could be doing this in a different way and it would probably run 10 to 50 to 100 times faster. Right. However, if you are using strings in pandas, how pandas represent strings is it doesn't have an optimized storage mechanism for strings. It basically has a buffer, but those buffers are pointing back to Python objects for the strings. So I'm okay with apply if you're doing apply on a series that has string data in it, because at that point you're already in the slow path. So that, that'd be my next one is just look for instances of apply. If you're using apply with numeric data, probably could be doing it faster. Awesome. So chaining, working with raw data, Jupyter uh, effective use, avoiding apply. You got a couple more for us, Matt? Sure. Uh, um, maybe I've got two more. Uh, one nice. is uh, using the correct types. So. This is another thing that is, is pretty important, and it and you see that in, in the tweak as well, where when we're loading our data, oftentimes people will load their data from a CSV file. And CSV files are nice in that they're human readable, but that's about the extent of the niceness of a CSV <laughs> file. Um, the other nice thing is that they're all over the place, which may or may not be nice. But oftentimes you'll get these CSV files, and they might be encoded in some weird Windows encoding, or they might have... Uh, characters that pandas doesn't understand. So pandas will try and convert nu numeric columns to num numbers, but if it has a string or some value that it doesn't understand, then it's gonna leave it as a string. So you, you have those sorts of issues. Um, so you, you do wanna make sure that you look at your types and, and just make sure that things that you thought were numeric are numeric. But another one is, and this goes back to our strings, and the pandas really doesn't optimize strings, but if you have categoric data where you have low cardinality, um, by default, if you read a CSV file in, Pandas is going to represent that as a bunch, you know, if you've got like car makes and you've got like 20 car makes and you've got 50,000 rows, it's going to be 50,000 Python strings. Well, that's probably not optimal. And Pandas does have a way to represent that with what's called a categorical type. 
And so if you use a categorical type for that column, you're going to have a huge memory savings because if there are only 20 unique values, what it can do is it can make basically like a mask that's going to give a bunch of integers that are going to reference the list of 20. So it's basically going to be a number from 1 to 20. And then if you, if you wanted or if you needed to do like string operations on the make, now instead of doing string operations on 50,000 Python objects, you're only doing that on 20. So not only do you get a memory, in, a memory savings from doing that, you can also potentially get a huge speed improvement from doing that. There is a point of crossover where when the cardinality gets to a certain point because of that layer of indirection where it makes sense to leave it as Python strings rather than categoricals. Nice. Great tip. All right. And then sixth and final one. Yeah. The, the next one would just be uh, learn to, to master aggregation. So this would be pivoting or group by. Right. This Definitely. is a syntax that can be a little bit different if you're not used to it, because generally it's, it's done in at least two or three steps where we specify what we want to group by, and then we might pull out what we want to group, and then we do aggregations to them instead of just one step. Or alternatively, there is a pivot table syntax. And uh, uh, my advice would just be start playing around with that and get used to that. It, it might seem a little bit overwhelming or confusing at first, but if you can master that, it's going to make slicing and dicing your, your data easier. If you need to start you know, making reports, you can do that. Or if you need to uh, uh, aggregate things at a certain level to prep them for machine learning, it's going to make it really easy to do that. Nice. All right. Amazing tips, Matt. I expected nothing less. And just so the listener is aware, Matt wasn't prepared with these. I ambushed him and I said, just before we started recording, I said, I'd love to have this episode. Just focus on your top tips for pandas. And he was like, sure. <laughs> and so there you go. His six top tips, chaining, working with raw data, effective use of Jupyter, avoiding apply, uh, having typing on your columns, making sure that you get those types right and then mastering aggregation or pivoting. Yeah, so I'm going to be sure many of these tips that you provided are ones that I already implement, but there were a few here that I wasn't aware of. For example, the avoiding apply. That was actually something, again, mentioning how I used to be big into R before Python. In R, the apply is actually a miracle helpful function that can make things like for loops run orders of magnitude more quickly. Mm. So that's the kind of thing I might have, if I see that in uh, pandas, I say, oh, great, something that's going to speed everything up for me. Meanwhile, it could be turning everything orders of magnitude slower. That's in interesting. Pandas, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not an R user at all. So that that actually is interesting. And maybe that explains a lot of it. Why people end up using it at all. Yeah. You're like, why are these people doing this? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. So you come from a computer science background. So uh, people with a computer science background, they tend to be much stronger on the Python uh Team Python <laughs> for data scientists. Mm -hmm. And then people who come from like a statistics background uh, tend to be more, uh, they're more likely to have come from an R background, at right. least for people our age, probably for younger people. It might not be the case anymore. I'm not sure. Um, but um, yeah, so that could be the genesis of, of why you see people still using uh, apply a lot in Python in pandas, even when it might be slowing them down. So super cool. Thank you, Matt. I learned a ton. I'm sure our listeners did as well. Um, so you've mentioned Metasnake, your consulting company. You have educated tons of leading organizations. Uh, I, there's an enormous list of them, but some of the big names include Stanford, uh, Netflix, and NASA. So you know, you're teaching some of the smartest people on the planet how they could be using Python or Pandas more effectively. Um, how do your engagements work? Uh, do you have, are they like typically shorter engagements, longer engagements? I guess it depends on what the client's looking for. Yeah. Typ typically my, my live training, which generally is done through zoom or some online media these days it is, uh, tends to be of the three to five half day length. And, and that would be, uh, sufficient for like an introductory Python course or an intermediate Python course or an introduction to Pandas course, that sort of thing. Uh, people often say like, this is basically like a semester long course packed into a few days is, is how those work. Um, and uh, the feedback on those is, is pretty awesome. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about something like that is you can take your team 
And even if you have different levels at the end of the course, they're all leveled up. They all have the same knowledge gaps filled in and they're not speaking past each other. What I find, especially with a lot of people, at least in coming from the, the data science side is, is they don't really have the software engineering background, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're using Python as a tool, but uh, they might have a bunch of knowledge gaps in there. So it's often useful to fill in some of those knowledge gaps, like how does Python work? Everything is an object in Python. And if you sort of master that idea that everything is an object in Python, sort of opens the doors of understanding of more complex things, but also lets you understand why certain operations in pandas might be slow. Uh, another thing that I, I do like to do with some of my live courses is adapt them to the client, which is kind of nice. Um, for example, uh, when I'm teaching a pandas course, I have canned data that I, I use, but I of, often will uh, take the client's data. And rather than teaching pandas with canned data, we will teach pandas with their data. And when I've done that, that's been super uh, those are probably been my best courses because mm -hmm. the students come in, they're already experts on their data. And mm -hmm. now it's just saying, oh, this is how I can use pandas or whatever tool to slice and dice my data. And there, there have been incredible insights uh, with people just, oh, digging into it and then, you know, creating visualizations and uh, having conversations with uh, colleagues that, uh, probably wouldn't have been able to happen had had we just used the can data there so that's that's something really powerful that you get with like a live training that i mean as much as i do like like on demand uh courses that sort of thing uh, it's it's really live training for i think corporations is is the best way to take a team and level it up yeah it's certainly the uh yeah it's it's the most yeah, it's the most impactful option, I think. Uh, it obviously means that then you're going to have to get kind of everybody aligned on timing. And, you know, in a non-pandemic world, then the instructor also needs to be there physically. And I think that that actually does also make a big impact. Like if you can physically be there, um, you know, it isn't the be all end all. You can absolutely have entirely online trainings be effective, but being there with the people, there's all kinds of questions that they might not raise their digital hand and ask. but if they're talking to you on the side of a classroom or when you go to the water cooler or whatever, um, there's all kinds of interesting questions that they might ask um, yeah. in that kind of scenario. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely, I agree with that. Since, the, since March 2020, I have not done an a, a in-person training, um, hmm. but I, I'm curious to see what that's going to look like. I mean, even some of my clients who are like very much like... Um, we need people in chairs sort of thing um, have gone virtual. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, how that sort of progresses, if that moves to like quarterly all hands where people are actually congregated. I, but like right. there is something to be said about looking at someone's face, watching them do it, and then being able to help them directly, which is the most powerful. But, you know, we are where we are right now. So we make the best of what we have. Yeah, I could see, see that being a really effective use of, this hybrid scenario where people are mostly working from home, but we say, okay, let's fly everybody in for a week for lessons on pandas, intermediate pandas lessons from Matt. Uh, he's going to be working with our data and, you know, that could be a good reason to get everyone together. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, you mentioned how it's half days and that's probably because you can only learn for so many hours in a day. And I think half a day is definitely the max. So then you could have half a day of uh, in-classroom instruction and then the other half of the day could be spent on projects or uh, meetings or planning or just going out for a team dinner since you haven't been able to do that for a quarter. Um, so that makes a lot of sense to me. You're also, you mentioned something in there that I think is helpful for any learning uh, with, with software in particular, uh, which is that if you want to learn something really well, do it with your own data. So you know, you're talking about that in a training context and how your trainings are more effective if you're using the client's data as opposed to just random data. And the same is true for you. When, when, when anybody's learning, it could be with an on-demand course or a YouTube video or a textbook, you're going to get um, a much more in-depth understanding if you import your own data and do some aggregating, pivoting, plotting with your data as opposed to just the demo data. Yeah. 
And, and so one of the things I did do with effective patents, I didn't do with learning the patents libraries, I added exercises. However, a lot of the exercises are actually uh, more project based and, and are taking this point of, of using your own data rather than saying like, given some data that Matt likes is using a data set of your choice, do this, which might seem like a cop out. But if you actually think about it to your point, if, if you have an interest in something, maybe it's a hobby or maybe it's data from work that you're paid to be interested in, uh, you're going to take learning a lot more seriously. And once you start digging into it and applying it, uh, your learning will be a lot more effective than just reading a book or listening to someone talk about it. Yep. A hundred percent. Awesome general learning tips. And I've got one more question for you uh, in that vein, Matt. So when people want to learn anything, it could be a software development concept or a data science concept, anything. Um, do you have tips on how they can most effectively do that? Yeah. And this is a common question I'm asked quite a lot. And, and obviously I'm highly biased, right? Because I, I, I'm in the education space. But as I mentioned previously, I think for a team, the, the most effective is to get everyone in the same room and, and sort of force them to do it. Um, for individuals, I, I think it's sort of a similar thing applies. And if you, if you look at like the highest performing individuals, you look at like maybe Steph Curry or presidents, they all have coaches, right? They all have someone who can help them. So if you can find someone who can help you, for me, that's been really beneficial in my career. It might be someone at work. Uh, it might be, you know, someone that is a friend of the family, or it might be someone that you pay to coach you. But if you can do that, what that's going to go back to our skiing example, right? If you've never skied, that's a really weird situation to be on uh, basically really long planks that slide because most people, when their feet are <laughs> on the ground, they don't slide. And mm -hmm. so learning to ski can be a challenge. Um, and so you can read about learning to ski all you want. But when you get on the slopes, if you have someone there who can coach you, I can guarantee you that you will learn a lot faster. You will learn more than from reading a book if you have a good coach there to help you. And so I think similarly, this applies to um, you know learning anything. If you have someone who's a master at that can sort of pick out your holes or where you need to practice, that can be something that can be useful. Um, and, and then there, there's just a broad swath of, of learning opportunities right now, right? You've got books, you've got courses, um, you've got free things as well, right? You've got YouTube. I mean, you could spend your whole life just researching and, and, and listening to YouTube. Um, but if, if you never apply it, if you never use it, um, that's certainly not useful. So my, my sort of practices or, or where I push someone is if you want to learn something, if you have someone who's a master who can take you along, that's great. Otherwise, you want to think about the path you're going on. And while random blog posts or Stack Overflow or random YouTube videos might be great, you really want to have some sort of track that is going to fill in knowledge gaps along the way. And a book or a dedicated course that has thought about that path that they're gonna take you along, I think is more effective. But you also need to couple that with practice. You, you really need to take your own data or start a project and try it out. Because if you don't, invariably what's going to happen is going to go in one ear and out the other. Nice. Amazing tips, Matt. Coaches and practically applying things, making sure that what you're applying is on the path, is on where you'd like to go, as opposed to just randomly following things. I love both of those learning tips. At the beginning of this episode, we talked about how many best-selling books you've written and how some of those are self-published. And you mentioned how you know it's long hours, you've got to stay motivated. There might not be a publisher there or some other stakeholder there on some project that has the carrot that they dangle in front of you or prods you with a stick. So particularly when you are the primary stakeholder on a project that you take on, like writing a self-published book, what are your tricks for staying motivated and continuing to be productive over long periods of time? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, and, and that's a challenge. I mean, I feel like a lot of times I'm, I'm not motivated, but may, maybe here are some hints. Um, <laughs> 
I mean, one one thing is that I'm sort of forced to just because the nature of my work where um, I'm, I guess, on my own, right? So I don't, I don't have anyone else doing anything for me. So if I want to continue doing what I'm doing, uh, you know, teaching and helping others, I need to sort of go out and, and find uh, my, I guess, you know, food that I'm going to eat or so to speak. And so for me, as someone who is an engineer and who feels like they're not great at selling, one of the most effective ways of me of getting myself out there is writing books. And and so mm. that might be some advice for anyone who's considering consulting or anything like that. Uh, it's a, a lot different when you're at like a conference, when we used to go to conferences to say like, hey, my name's Matt or whatever, and versus saying, hey, I'm Matt and I wrote the book on such and such topic. And, and so I think this is really a powerful hack for people who want to maybe go out on their own or want to start maybe consulting is considering, um, you know, making a book. And, and again, that can be somewhat stressful. So maybe, maybe some hints for, for making a book. Um, one thing would be, uh, uh, if, if you aren't working with a publisher might be to make some public commitments. These, these are just sort of hacks. If, if people know that you are making it and you're sort of like putting it out there, or you maybe make a landing page, that might be something that motivates you to uh, start working on it or continue working on it. Another thing might be to limit the scope of it. Um, you know, once you, you get into some of these things, you're like, oh, there, there's so much I could cover. And I've already had people who are like, the book doesn't cover this. Yeah, it doesn't cover, you know, geographic information systems uh, with pandas or it doesn't cover extension arrays and pandas so the the you might want to consider limiting the scope of that um that that's something else another thing i, I mean i'm a fan of like deep work and limiting interruptions so uh setting aside time for when you can work on something i've got four kids so oftentimes no kidding you know, e evenings is wow. e evenings is sort of set apart for family um and so it might be you get up an hour earlier in the morning for for writing something like that, or you can just uh, work on that without uh, distractions. Um, so so those are some hints. I guess one more would just be um, coming back to maybe the idea of deep work. For for me, I found that if I'm just like cranking away, I burn out very quickly. So I do need to interrupt myself. So it might be taking a walk, taking a nap. I, I mean, I, I do live pretty close to a ski resort. So if, <laughs> if it's a powder day, I might go skiing in the morning. Um, so, so those are some things that, you know, you can split that up. I'm going to be productive at this point in time, but uh, uh, separate that out. Um, as far as like compensation wise, right? I mean, you, you should set your, your, your level of, of your compensation uh, at an appropriate uh, expectation. And so I, I would say, you know, for most people, uh, you would probably more be more effective or you, as far as like payment, if you did consulting rather than writing a book. Right. Um, but, but for me, I'm playing the long game, right? And, and right, so, right, right. so for me, uh, writing a book and getting myself out there is, is what is bringing me business rather mm -hmm. than uh, just doing one-off consulting jobs, which might 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 pay off in the long run or get uh, further clients. But um, uh, that that's a trade-off that you might want to consider as well. Uh, that long-term strategy, I think, is a great one, Matt, because the more books that you write, say, the more expertise that you demonstrate, it probably means that your consulting rates go up. So if in the short term you are you're you're not maximizing your returns in year one of book writing because you're spending so much of the time writing the book as opposed to doing consulting, by year 10 or year 20, after there are a series of best selling books out, say, um, or a series of maybe not best selling, but that demonstrate a clear expertise in a focused area that you can consult on. Um, that could mean that in year 10 or year 20, you're charging 10 X 
per hour of consulting. And now all of a sudden, uh, your returns are, are exponentially more than they would have been in, in the scenario where you're just trying to maximize, uh, uh, consulting in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, so look at, look, look at that again, in, in my course on book writing, I interview a bunch of authors. Some of them had made, uh, six plus figures directly from their book. Some of them have made significantly more than six plus figures and some of them have made a lot less. Right. And so you do have these outliers of, of certain books are going to sell a lot and that's just the name of the game with content creation. But I, mm -hmm. I do think, you know, looking at you're, you're absolutely correct. If, and this would go to, you know, anyone who wants to maybe, and it's not just if you want to be a consultant, but I think it, it goes to maybe this meta question of that people might have of like, how do I get a job or how do I get a better job, right? And so things like writing a book are things that are putting you out there, but are also demonstrating your expertise. And it makes, it just greases a lot of the skids. If you want to interview at some place or, you know, do consulting at some place or even, you know, speaking at a conference, oftentimes uh, with some, you know, something like a book that can push the odds in your favor. Totally. Well, you're preaching to the choir in my case, Matt, uh, but some great uh, tips for, your, for the Super Data Science audience there as well. So we do actually have some Super Data Science audience member questions coming up for you. But quickly, before we get to that, you have a bachelor's degree in computer science from Stanford. And so we've alluded to that fact a couple of times in this episode that you have this computer science background and how you came into data science from that perspective. How has a formal computer science education been helpful to your career as a data scientist, maybe uh, specifically, and then maybe even more generally as uh, as a business person, as a consultant. Yeah, I, I and I think there are generally two takes on this from from the data science crowd. Right, there's uh, the I would say the the more mathy statistical take, and then there's more the programmatic take. And I don't know that either one of them is necessarily correct. I can only speak from my experience, which is going to be from the programming side. Now, I actually, I really like the joke that a data scientist is somebody who isn't good at statistics or programming, which is definitely how, what I am. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say that my, my statistics is probably lacking quite a bit. And, and um, uh, some people might see that as a huge flaw, right? But I, I would say yeah, that yeah. my my uh, software engineering is is probably significantly better than than most data scientists. So right. th there are gives and takes there, right? Um, what I've seen is, is that a lot of people, I think I alluded to this previously, who are, who are data scientists don't necessarily want to be programmers, but basically they are programmers. I mean, you could say the mm -hmm. same thing about Excel users who are using Excel right. in some uh, capacity that, uh, you know, doing VLOOKUPs. Um, and, and so there are certain practices that if you adopt them are going to make your life easier and going to make collaborating and working with others easier that, I, I get that you don't want to be a programmer or whatnot, but uh, once you start having to work with others and you, you really want to start adopting some of these practices. So I, I think that's certainly useful for, for um, data scientists to have some software engineering background. I mean, some, some things that would be useful for a lot of them is um, like learning to understand Git to, to manage uh, source control. Um, I think a lot of people I've seen have very limited exposure to the command line. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, in the Python world, the command line is basically used all over the place. So if you're, it's not to say that you have to have that, but you, you are, you are going to make things harder for yourself if, if you don't have some basic command line usage there as well. Um, and then just sort of general programming practices that I see violated all the time. I mean, probably the most egregious one is, and Jupyter sort of encourages that, is just globals all over the place, using globals all over the place, which right. it, 
a trained software engineer, that's like a huge no, no, but yeah. we sort of overlook that in Jupyter land. Yep. Those are great tips. So, um, get the Unix command line and avoiding global variables, um, on the note of the Unix command line, there's an interesting episode number 531 with Jeroen Janssens. It is specifically on data science at the command line. Actually, he's another O'Reilly author and has written yeah. a book on that title. And that is a really interesting episode. It isn't from the perspective of, hey, you should know Unix because Python is going to be running on top of it and it'll be easier in some cases. It's from this interesting perspective of Unix being a glue between all different kinds of programming languages. So um, you, can, you can use it uh, flexibly uh, as kind of like a, um, uh, a Rosetta Stone between uh, different programming languages. So then you can... You can learn some pandas for some specific task. You can learn um, some R uh, package for some plotting task. And you can have Unix uh, as a glue kind of blending everything together. So kind of a cool episode. Anyway, um, those are really great tips, Matt. And yeah, I can see how programming best practices would definitely be useful uh, for collaborating with colleagues. And so I really appreciate um, those tips there. All right. so. Let's move on to some audience questions. We got some great ones here on Twitter for you. Um, so uh, some of them are quite pragmatic and some of them are uh, quite high level. So uh, let's start with one that's, um, that's pretty high level. So uh, this user here, uh, Jagriti, is wondering where a data science enthusiast should begin from if they're just getting started. Yeah. Um, yeah. Infamous question you ask 10 data scientists, you'll get 10 different responses. Um, where should you begin from? A again, the term data science is so broad that 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 is kind of a challenge, right? I mean, I, I think we're we're finally seeing roles sort of come into play, where you have like a machine learning engineer or someone who's more mm -hmm. interested in DevOps. So mm -hmm. I think one thing that you might want to consider is like where do you want to focus, right? And you know, if if your thing is diving deep into the data, if that's your thing, then then maybe you focus on uh, understanding. Uh, how to slice and dice data, you start learning about making some models, uh, doing some visualizations. If your thing is more like deploying this and monitoring this, you might want to pick up more of, of the programming skills. I think the hard thing, John, is that a lot of people, they just hear data scientists and are like, data scientists make a lot of money, so I want to do that. <laughs> but they really don't know what they want to do. Right. right. So, so that's sort of a chicken and egg. How do you, how do you they know? Want to make you money, want to Matt. They know what they want to do. They yeah. want to make a lot of money. Yeah. So, so I mean, if you can probably interview, I mean, this this would be what I would say prior to pandemic life um, would be uh, leverage a network. And, and in, in past, um, when I would say a, a killer tip would be to go to some meetups, like in. In Salt Lake, there's totally. there's Python meetups, there's data science meetups, there's Python data meetups, and I would say go to those and just throw yourself and don't just sit back, but actually like introduce yourself and say, hey, I'd like to talk to some people because I'm a student or I'm, I'm interested in breaking into this. Generally, there's a lot of people there who are hiring, and there are a lot of people there who are willing to to talk because that's why people go to these things because there are these introverted nerds who need at some point to like demonstrate that they can talk and interact with others. But, but that would give you, you know, some insight into how people are really, what people are really doing. Right. So interviewing, figuring out what you really like. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I sort of go back to that uh, best practice for learning. I've got a blog post on this. It's like, it's it's written what's the best way to learn python in 2021 but i think you could oh, adopt nice. that to what you could replace python with whatever you wanted to um but i think at, at some point you know after you sort of figured out what you want to do you need to come up with this path and game plan of, of breaking in there so um what are some things that might get you into 
the door as, I mean, I, maybe I'll speak broadly rather than just like a data scientist versus data engineer, right? Someone, someone, a lot of times people will want to see a degree or some sort of pedigree. So that, that may or may not be your case. Um, you do have sort of the boot camp option. I'm going to say if you go the boot camp route, you're going to have to have a lot of projects and be able to talk about those proficiently, such that they're basically like we don't have any doubt that you're sort of equivalent to someone who has a degree. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of people who are coming from PhDs in non uh, like uh, physics or math, and they're like. Basically, I don't want to wait to, for a prof to die, and so I'm going to pivot over to data science. Um, so again, you 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 would need a lot of these people have like the math, but th they would need to have some sort of portfolio, right, to demonstrate to someone that they're interested in that. There, there's a lot of projects that you can do, right? There's Kaggle, um, like you can take my book and start working up the assignments. But I I would say, come up with a project that demonstrates. Uh, proficiency. I mean, you can also be a little bit more direct if you have certain companies that you want to work with. You might like go out and do a project that's sort of semi-related to what they're doing exactly, and then sort Great of idea. link to someone in, in LinkedIn or, or try and connect with someone, and then like pitch that to them directly or ask them for feedback Great. on that. Great idea. I love that. Um, I, the least effective thing is just to like say, "I'm, I'm going to send out a bunch of resumes." Um, yeah, that. That can work, but basically you're playing a numbers game then, and it's 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 not effective. So you you do you want to network um, again? In the past, meetups were a great way to do that. There are virtual meetups. LinkedIn might be a great way to do that. Even Twitter um, might be a great way to do that. Um, and get your foot in the door, and and then start demonstrating proficiency. Nice. I love all of that guidance. It was a big open-ended question, and you gave an excellent uh, answer with lots of different options that are appropriate to the disparateness of the field. And actually that ties back to something, you know, you just talking about the computer science education you have and the relative software engineering strength that you have as a data scientist. Something that I could have mentioned then and will mention now is that um, because there is such a broad range of specializations in data science, um, it, it lends well to people coming from all different kinds of backgrounds. And so, um, you yeah, know, lots of opportunities there for people uh, wherever you're coming from into the field, just get yeah. started. And maybe one more thing is, is don't get frustrated. Um, and, and maybe th this might sound pessimistic, but don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, just because someone rejects you does not mean that you're not qualified or whatnot. Um, I've been rejected a lot, a lot of companies. Um, and, and so it, it is still a numbers game, but you know, if you're like, my dream job is to work at such and such company, and then you interview with them and they reject you, th that's not the end of the world. Keep keep going on. Um, keep applying. Um, and you might have had a bad day. They might have had a bad day. Um, it, it's not the end of the world. So that, that can be a challenge because a lot of people are like, well, I, I've interviewed at this place and they rejected me. And so I'm not qualified. That, that doesn't mean anything. Again, Various roles, how people describe various roles mean different things to different people. So um, yeah, keep at it. And actually on the flip side of that, if you aren't getting rejected from anything, then you're not aiming high enough. Yeah, if, that's good every, if you're always being accepted to everything that you do or you're always succeeding at everything that you try, you're not taking big enough risks. That's a great way to look at it. I love that. Um, all right, so then following on from that general data science um, question, there is one, I think you might have a very specific answer to this. Um, Adil asks, how do you master pandas? <laughs> what should be the essential steps uh, to be taken to get to that level? Yeah, I mean, highly biased, right? Uh, right. So, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll just give general points rather than just say read my book and and do that but um uh, um one thing that you need to be aware of is that from my point of view uh, like after i wrote my first book about pandas and, and i think it when someone geeks out on something all of us have things that we geek out on it might be skiing or it might be like pandas or it might be whatever 
but you you tend to like study up on that or you tend if you and my phone like pops up anything that has pandas it's like yeah, here's 50 medium articles about pandas for the last <laughs> week and so i might scroll through those so a lot of what you see in that is regurgitated content and a lot of that is bad regurgitated content so that that again that's part of the reason why i put my book out there because there's a lot of like people who want to start blogging and that they kind of don't know what they're doing so they start writing blog posts it's like okay how to use pandas but the content they put out is is actually not good advice so i i would recommend trying to go to a more authoritative source rather than just random blog posts so that might be a book like mine it might be taking a course it might be going to the the pandas documentation as well um to to get sort of best practices uh from experience rather than just uh sort of blind teaching the blind so but again it, it comes back to practicing um and and so it, if you just read about it, I, I think most people's brains are going to forget about it unless they do some sort of uh, space repetition to keep it in there. So the science tells us that if you practice it you and physically type it out, you're going to make different connections with your brain and you will remember it better. So, so um, get good uh, information, practice it. And then don't be afraid to uh, revisit it or review it or share it with others. Uh, so you might have, you know, um, we talked about the importance of a mentor, someone who can uh, guide you. And so and don't be afraid to ask for feedback on that from someone who's, who's more experienced as well. Nice. Great tips. Again, definitely I can uh, confirm that doing something uh, for yourself, especially if it's not just taking, as we already talked about earlier, the data that are provided to you in the example, but pulling in your own data. And you could then you could do something very similar. You could, you know, use the same method as you're going through in the tutorial, but use it on your own data. And then maybe just change a few of the arguments. Maybe you'll have to change a few of the arguments because your data are different. Um, but uh, yeah, just, just experiment a little bit and you will uh, quickly pick things up. And I can recommend because you're being too modest, Matt, but a deal you could uh, definitely uh, work through the Effective Pandas book by Matt Harrison, and you will be, uh, you know, not a master just by reading, but if you can go through it and apply everything that you've read uh, on your own data, then you'll be pretty close to being a master. Oh, thanks, John. I hope All so. All right. And then Vipin, I don't know if this is a question. I'm going to be interested to hear what your answer is. Vipin has a very, after those kind of two big, broad questions, there's one here that I think might be so specific, it's kind of impossible to answer, but maybe, you know, you're the expert, so you might be able to, uh, to cut right into it, which is how many rows and columns can a pandas data frame load? <laughs> uh, 58. Oh, no, 42, <laughs> 42. Uh, uh, yes, 42. Um, interesting question. Um, I, I, maybe I can answer that in a different way that... Uh, might be a little bit more roundabout, but I, I like to term pandas as a small data tool. And what I mean by small data is data that will fit on a single machine. Mm -hmm. people, some people call that different things, but I just call that small data versus from my, from my point of view, big data is multiple machines. So what small data means to you is somewhat context dependent, right? I mean, 10 years ago, small data was like eight gigs or six you know, 16 gigs or something. But now, nowadays you can get, I mean, my laptop has 64 gigs in it, but you can go out to the cloud and you can rent a computer that has uh, many multiples of that in it as well, right? So um, that's sort of your first constraint. Um, but some other things that you need to take into account, again, is that pandas is small data, so it has to keep things in memory, but due to the nature of how pandas works and that generally we're doing these chain operations that return uh, data frames along the way, you're gonna have to have some overhead for copying your objects. And I, and, and I, some people are probably gonna say, well, Matt, if you just use this in place op, uh, parameter on, on your methods, you'll get around that. Um, so anyone who's saying that, um, if you open up the source code for most of these operations that have in place, they actually make a copy under the covers and then shim it in. So you're not, 
in place really doesn't do what you want. And there's actually a bug uh, with the intent to remove it completely from pandas just because most people see that and it, it does not reflect what's really going on with pandas. Um, so so you, you need to have, I, I like to say three to 10x the amount of memory as the size of your data set. Um, so gotcha. that might be somewhat problematic, but again, remember one of my other hints was use the correct types. So another thing that you can do that I've seen is oftentimes, especially if you have a lot of string data, especially if it's low cardinality categorical data, mm -hmm. uh, by changing those strings to categories, you can save a huge amount of memory that way. Also, uh, for numeric data, if, if you have integers and um, by default, pandas is going to use an eight byte integer to represent that. If, if you have smaller integers, you can use smaller uh, sizes to do that and you can do the same thing with floats as well. So I, I have seen cases where you load your data set as a raw CSV, and by doing a few of these changes, you get it to like 5% of that size without any loss of fidelity of the data, and not even considering like maybe you need to filter out some of the columns or rows. So those are some things that you can do, but but do remember that, that Pandas, the, the library itself is a small data library. Now, and sort of side note uh, briefly on that, uh, what we're also seeing these days is there's not only Pandas the library, but there's now Pandas the API. And the Python and data science community has basically standardized on if you're using Python, uh, then uh, we want to provide an, a Pandas-like API. And so you see that in uh, a tool called Dask, you see that in a tool called Modin, you see that in a tool called Spark, um, Spark with I think 3.2 just recently merged uh, a commit which was called the Pandas API. The idea being that Pandas, for better or for worse, is the de facto API for data manipulation. And so, uh, you know, a lot of banks, uh, bio companies, um, insurance companies who are using Pandas and now they need to start scaling out. Uh, want to leverage that pandas code and so these other platforms are offering them a path to do that yeah super cool answer i am blown away that you were able to go into that level i mean i shouldn't be surprised but i am blown away <laughs> at the level of detail that you went into on answering what sounded like a simple question like how many rows and columns can a pandas data frame load and not only did you answer the question uh but you also gave us lots of cool tips on how to maximize um what you can fit in, how much data you can fit in uh, on a given single machine. But now digging into that question about, uh, you know, going from small data with just a single machine to big data with uh, multiple uh, machines processing your data or holding your data. Um, our final question is from Alex Monahan, who asks, um, you know, he, he actually has specific uh, questions about these alternatives. So you mentioned some of them. He also uh, mentions Dask, Modin. Uh, you mentioned Spark. He also mentions Viax and Arrow. Um, so he says, do you have any thoughts on some of the larger than memory pandas-like alternatives? Uh, which ones are easiest to write clean and effective code with? Which ones scale most easily? So it's interesting. Uh, it, you kind of actually already answered one of those questions because it sounds like some of these, including with the Spark 3.2 update that you mentioned, will use the Pandas API. So that sounds like they could potentially be some of the easiest to write clean and effective code with. But I'll, I'll leave it for you to answer. So which ones are the easiest to write clean and effective code with and which ones scale most easily? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I'll caveat this with in uh, sample size one, um, in my consulting and training engagements, um, I've had limited experience with Dask and Spark, but um, certainly not uh, in anywhere rel uh, the same as my small data experience. So I, I don't consider myself a, a big data expert, but let, let me just maybe give a little bit more insight into that. So I, I have a list of like alternate platforms of Pandas here on my desk and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 10, 11, 12, at least like 13 different alternate platforms where it's pandas the api versus um pandas the the, the library that uh, sort of started this out um 
so as far as scaling out, I, I think your your most robust solutions, you're going to be looking at Spark, you're going to be looking at Dask, and I would say Modin as well. Um, so Modin uh, is, is and, and let me maybe talk about those uh, from so, so, some pros and cons of them. Uh, Spark, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's written on the JVM Scala, um, but because of people you know, doing a lot of data science in Python. They do have a Python interface for that. They, I think the Pandas API is is kind of like their third iteration of using a data frame like API. Um, so I have not actually used that in Happiness or in Anger, but um, that that was merged there. My understanding is it, it's not a hundred percent compatible, but uh, a good a good chunk compatible. Um, but my understanding is that you you have pretty good scale out there as well. Um, Dask uh, has uh, a pandas API that is pretty good as well. Um, um, and and then you have Modin. And my understanding, uh, actually, from speaking to some of the Modin folks, is that their goal is one hundred percent API uh, implementation to the extent that they will even replicate bugs in, in wow. pandas um, with, with the intent there that like a lot of, you know, some of these pandas users that are industrial strength or, or you know, big company enterprises that are using pandas do want to scale out and they're looking to be the tool for them to say, just drop your code in here, right? Rather than we've got 90% of the API, but we have, we're, we're, we're com so committed to the API that we are even writing the same bugs so so that it won't magically work on Modin rather than <laughs> uh, on, on Pandas. Um, there are some other ones as well. A, a new one I just heard of the other week was Turality, which I guess is a service, and, and they're doing like serverless Pandas scaling, right? I don't know the extent of the API conformity there, but I mean, they they... All, all of these are offering Pandas APIs. So it, it is certainly a space to watch. And I, I think competition is good in general because it makes everyone play harder and play better. So, uh, but from my point of view, that, that just makes investing, um, investing in Pandas a good investment right now. Because as you said, Python is the most popular data science language and you can People can be upset at me for saying that, but um, I think the numbers play that out. Mm -hmm. And and Pandas is probably one of the most popular, if not for structured or tabular data, the most popular tool for doing that. So I think it really, if, if you are in, in that place where you have database tables or spreadsheets and you need to start using Python, uh, Pandas is, is the place to go right now. And an investment in Pandas is a wise investment. Yep, and uh, I think that's a time investment <laughs> as opposed to uh, trading advice. Uh, it'd be fun if you could trade in open source <laughs> libraries. Yeah, you might uh, have to say this is not investment <laughs> advice, right? The disclaimer. <laughs> exactly. Um, put all your money on pandas. <laughs> um, it's the sure thing. Well, all I'm, right. I'm starting a pandas uh, ICO, <laughs> a pandas <laughs> NFT. Nice. Um, I'm sure it will skyrocket. <laughs> um, so uh, we're, we've gotten through the audience questions. Matt, uh, my only last real question for you is if you have a book recommendation for us. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, offer this book here, The Programmer's Ooh. Brain, um, yeah. which I, I think is pro probably relevant to almost everyone uh, reading this. Or listening to this, um, and the programmer's brain is not language specific or job specific, even though it says programmers. But again, I think people who are who are listening to this should be uh, interested in this. It's basically taking a step back and looking at how we learn, right, and um, how to grok code, how you think about code, how your brain works. I think those are good things to do. It's got some really good. Uh, assignments that are basically reflections. I tried to do some of this recently uh, when I did the advent of code, which is a, a coding competition in, in December. 
And I, I went through and I actually documented every error that I made as I was doing that and sort of classified those types of errors just, just as a meta thing of like being more mindful about how you code and how you create things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think anyone who's working with a computer, uh, this is a great book to, to read and give them a chance to think about how they're doing that. I think a lot of times we don't even think about it. But I, if you start thinking about it, I think that uh, can give you a, a slight insight into what you're doing and, and may even make it so you do things in a more effective way. Nice. That's a really, really cool recommendation, Matt. And I had not heard of that book. It sounds super interesting. It sounds like a pragmatic tip for yeah, data scientists or anybody uh, interacting uh, with code. All right. And then it's abundantly clear, Matt, that you are a go-to expert on any topics related to Python, particularly the Pandas library. Uh, how can people stay in touch with you and stay up to date on your latest, your book releases, your thoughts, and so on? Awesome. Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter. So Dunder M. Harrison, underscore, underscore, M. Harrison, underscore, underscore. I'm on LinkedIn, happy to connect with people on LinkedIn. I also have a, a newsletter. Uh, if you go to metasnake.com, I have a newsletter there. Uh, people can connect uh, with me there. So again, I tend to uh, share uh, not a lot of cat pictures, but more uh, code pictures. So uh, definitely... Uh, try and provide a lot of good content uh, on those platforms. All right. So for those super data science listeners looking for lots of cat photos, sorry, uh, you'll have to wait until our special <laughs> cat episode coming up later. I don't know. Um, all right, Matt, thank you so much. It's been so much fun having you on the show. I've learned a ton. I have no doubt that our listeners did too. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. Uh, let me offer your listeners a discount. So uh, I'll give you a um, discount code, and that will work on my Pandas bundle or on, on the Effective Pandas book. The bundle includes the book and some courses on Pandas. Awesome. Yeah, so we will put that in the show notes so that you can use that special discount code. What kind of percentage are we talking about here, Matt? Oh, well, let's do 30% off. Wow. All right, 30% off. There you go. Um, amazing. Well, Matt, let's, do 40, let's do 42% off. I'll do 42% off <laughs> oh my just for, goodness. just for, just for super data science listeners. All right. That's incredible. 42% off for super data science <laughs> listeners. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, thank you for being on the show and we'll catch you again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, John. I thoroughly enjoyed filming this episode with Matt and I learned a ton, I hope you did too. In today's episode, Matt filled us in on his six top tips for pandas, namely chaining, working with the raw data, executing Jupyter notebooks from top to bottom, avoiding apply, typing the columns of your data frames and becoming adept at aggregating and pivoting data. He also talked about how to learn anything effectively by having a coach and applying what you've learned to the broader path you're trying to follow. He talked about how programming best practices are useful for collaborating in data science. He provided his recommendations to become familiar with Git version control, the Unix command line, and avoiding global variables in your code. And he filled us in on how Spark, Dask, and Modin could be great options for you for scaling the processing of tabular data to multiple machines, particularly if you'd like to remain within the comfort of programming via the Pandas API standard. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Matt's Twitter and LinkedIn profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 557. That's superdatascience.com slash 557. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like several audience members did of Matt during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter, as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you for your thoughtful inquiries. All right, thank you to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another deeply educational episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks. And I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.